who will speak about Chile's way of development. I would like to begin by acknowledging the presence here today of a number of distinguished ministers, ambassadors, and other members of the Chilean delegation. A warm Colombia welcome to you all. This week, heads of state from around the world are here in New York City for the United Nations General Assembly, and we at Colombia are delighted to welcome several of these leaders to campus. The World Leaders Forum was founded in 2003 by University President Lee Bollinger to support robust dialogue on the most pressing issues facing our global society. It is an opportunity that would be difficult, if not impossible, to duplicate in any other city or at any other university. Columbia has always been among the most international of institutions in the most global of American cities, with a large and growing percentage of our students and faculty drawn from foreign nations. Our academic mission demands a global perspective, and discussions like the one we're about to have today are a cornerstone of this pursuit. To further that global perspective, we have also spent the last four years creating a global network, a network of global centers in eight cities around the globe, including Santiago de Chile, whose center opened in March 2012. This Colombia Global Center is among our most active and engaged under the able direction of former minister Karen Poniacic. There are already more than 93 Chilean students studying at Colombia, 93 to be precise. Some of our most distinguished faculty were born in Chile, but there aren't enough of either. A growing number of Colombia students and faculty in all fields are now discovering Chile. Thank you, Mr. President, for making this possible. Our colleagues have already been discovering new paths. Colombia School of Journalism recently announced a partnership with the Instituto de, de la Comunicación e Imagen of the Universidad de Chile. Colombia's Earth Institute is already collaborating with UNESCO and colleagues in Chile on a project to manage water in an arid part of the country. Students from our School of International and Public Affairs have been conducting field studies with Chilean mining companies, and Colombia Business School students have recently visited the Carrozzi food processing plant to learn about Chile's exemplary business practices. President Piñera, a native of Santiago, is a Harvard-trained economist, <clears throat> a successful businessman, and a former senator. In 2010, he became Chile's first conservative president since military rule ended in 1990. He has tackled many challenges during his presidency, including, including reconstruction following one of the most devastating earthquakes in Chile's history, and the now famous rescue of the trapped miners near Copiapó. President Piñera is leading a country which marked its own so somber con commemoration of September 11th earlier this month, on the 40th anniversary of the Armed Forces coup in 1973, that installed a military regime headed by Army General Augusto Pinochet. Nearly a quarter century since the restoration of democracy, Chile has come far in terms of unity, human rights, and democracy, and has distinguished itself as a model for achieving sustained economic growth. Echoes of the Pinochet era still reverberate, however. Term limits prevent President Piñera from running for re-election this year, although Nobody's ruling out future years. The leading candidates competing to replace him have captured the world's attention with the gripping story told by their intertwined personal histories. Former Chilean President Michel Bachelet, who spoke at our World Leaders Forum in 2007, is the candidate of the center-left. She was tortured under Pinochet's rule, and her father, a general in the army, was tortured and killed. Evelyn Matai is a member of the center-right coalition whose father was a leading figure in the military regime. They represent, along with President Piñera, a generation of leaders who have come to the center of Chile's political stage long after Pinochet's departure, but who nonetheless continue to confront issues informed by the nation's authoritarian past. Whoever emerges as the next president of Chile will be leading a country that is now acclaimed for its growth, productive work workforce, and transparent institutions. Yet, like many nations, it is a country with an alarming gap dividing the rich and the poor. Earlier this year, President Piñera explained that the key to er eradicating poverty and establishing Chile as a developed nation will be for the country to grow, grow around 6 percent, not over one, two, or three years, but many more. This insightful and truthful comment 
is reflective of his tenure as President of Chile, a tenure that has been marked by a willingness to squarely face difficult problems and then present solutions in a straightforward and unvarnished manner. I'm now very pleased to invite President Sebastian Piñera to the stage to share more of his ideas on Chile's way of development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your kind words. And as President of Chile, I'm very happy and enthusiastic because we have just signed a cooperation agreement with Columbia University, which will add up to the agreements that we already have with Berkeley, MIT, and Harvard, which are among the best universities in the world. And this is part of our commitment with knowledge, with science, with technology. Chile was the poorest Spanish colony in the end of the world, separated from the world with, by uh, the driest deserts, the biggest ocean, the highest mountain, and the South Pole. But despite that, we have managed to become now the country with the highest per capita income in Latin America. But that's not enough because we are fully aware that the mission that we have to accomplish is to transform Chile before the end of this decade. So, so it's a very short challenge and goal into a developed country without poverty, with uh, more equality of opportunities, and that's the mission of our generation. We have just celebrated our bicentennial. There are very few countries, among them the U.S., that have been able to celebrate their bicentennial since as an independent state. So I would like to share with you my views and some facts and evidence about what has been called the Chilean path to development. First of all, if you take a look at how the worldwide GDP and population has evolved in the last 2,000 years, you see that nothing happened or very little happened between the times of Cleopatra and uh, Marco Antonio, and the times of Napoleon. But at that time, a big change started to occur. As you see, in the 19th century, and particularly in the 20th century, the world radically changed. And this is basically due to the, what was called the Industrial Revolution. At that time, life expectancy almost doubled in a few in a few decades, but more important than that, you see how the evolution of world population and world GDP started to grow very, very fast. In general, the past century, the 20th century, we saw a huge explosion in our capacity to create, but also a huge explosion in our capacity to destroy. It was a century that witnesses the moment Man took his first step on the moon, but also we saw the emergence of man's capacity to destroy the world several times and the century that witnesses the worst and most cruel wars, like was the First and the Second World War. But despite that, the evolution of GDP and also the evolution of population and economic growth during this period was very, very uneven. You can see in this graph that some countries were able to take advantage of the Industrial Revolution, mainly the United States, Western Europe, Japan, and that's it. The rest of the world lagged behind. Latin America, which is a vast and fertile land, very extremely rich in natural resources, a continent that did not experience the two world wars as did Europe, that has not suffered the religious conflicts that have led people to kill each other in the name of the same God as happened in Europe, that has not had the radical conf the racial conflicts that the colonization of Africa left behind. In other words, Latin America has always had everything to reach development, and yet it has not yet taken advantage of all these opportunities. 
And this is something that we want to change. But in the past 20 years, not only the world has changed. First, the Berlin Wall fell, relegating communists only to Cuba and North Korea. But at the same time, something more astonishing happened. The center of the world began to move eastward, and Chile went from a forgotten corner at the bottom of the world, known as the Finisterra, to face the ocean of the future, the, o the ocean on which the eyes of three quarters of the population are set. And I'm talking about the Pacific Ocean. Nowadays, the world is converging with few exceptions. We are looking at the second wave of modernization that no walls can hold back. It is this new world of technology and information that has given a second chance to those countries that didn't took advantage of the first chance, which was the Industrial Revolution, to reach development and to integrate itself to what is called the first world. Let's see how the world is evolving now. The emerging economies begin to gain ground vis-a-vis -vis the developed world. You can see here the participation of the share of total GDP by developed countries and emerging economies, and today is basically a tie, 50, 50 percent, which was not the case only 20 years ago. Especially China and India, the giant, the Asian giants, are recovering the place that they used to have in the world and that they lost. And you can see how they are representing a bigger and bigger percentage of the world total economy. The emerging countries are recovering much faster than the developed world after the financial crisis of 2008. And you can see here how the recovery or the growth rate of different countries differs, especially between developed and developing countries. GDP projection by region shows that if everything continues as it is, China will become the largest economy by the year 2000 and between 2025 and 2030, and that will imply a major change in the political, economic, and social structures of the world. Now, coming back to Chile. In 2010, we celebrated our 200 years of independence. Here you have a picture with the five presidents that are still alive, and we joined together to celebrate this bicentennial. And now we want to make another step, to take another step, a giant step towards development and defeating poverty. And for that, it's good to ask us how well we have done or how poorly we have done. And the answer to that question depends with whom we compare ourselves. If we compare ourselves with the world, with Latin America, Chile has done a very good job, particularly as you can see there in the last 30 years, when we started to grow much faster than the rest of the region. And that's why we were able to move from one of the lowest positions in terms of per capita income to the first position in terms of per capita income. But uh, by, by, by that standard, the this country, which was so isolated, decided at a given point in time to integrate to the world. And right now, Chile has free trade agreement with more than 60 countries around the world, among them the US, China, Europe, India, Japan, Korea, you name it. So basically, this small country, which was in the end of the world, the Finisterra, is now a country which is willing to strength its its integration to the world. If we compare ourselves with Latin America, you see that Chile was among the lowest per capita income in, in the region and now has become the country with the highest per capita income in the country and probably the country with the best opportunity to become a developed country and to defeat poverty before the end of this decade because you have to put a date in order to transform a, a dream into a project, into a real commitment. In terms of comparing Chile with the rest of the world, you see 
that for a long period of time it was a kind of tie, then we lost and we lagged behind, but we had been able to recover and we are growing much faster than the rest of the world and therefore we are moving in the right direction. Right now, Chile is in a position with a 20,000 per capita income to catch up some European countries like Portugal or Greece or, or, or including other countries if we keep growing at 6%. We are part of the OECD and therefore our task is not just to do better than other Latin American countries. Our real mission is to become a developed country in all the real meaning of that world. But if we compare ourselves with the best, you see that except for the last three years, we also have been lagging behind. Here is a comparison between the OECD countries and Chile. The question is, what is what we need to, uh, to achieve before the end of this decade? What is the mission of the generation of the bicentennial, which is our responsibility? And basically, our mission is a very ambitious one, a very noble one, a very demanding one, but we think that is also an achievable one, which is basically to transform Chile into a country without poverty and with real opportunities for everybody and to overcome underdevelopment. This, we know, is a huge challenge, which was the dream of our fathers, our grandfathers. They always cherished this accomplishment, but they never were able to achieve it. And we hope that we were able to change that history. This is the challenge with which our government came to power three years ago. And for that, of course, we will need to change history and to take advantage of all the potentialities of this small country in the end of the world, very close to the South Pole. So I want to talk about the future. The difference between the future and the past is only one. The past is already written. We can talk about it for years, but we cannot, we cannot change a comma about it. But the future is something very different. It is not written, and therefore we can dip our pens into ink and begin to write it. And that's basically what we want to do. How? First of all, we are fully aware of the importance of what has been called the old pillars of development. A stable democracy, that we have it. Remember that Chile had been always, almost always, a very stable democracy since our independence, except for a couple of interruptions. The last one, as was mentioned, was in 1973, when a coup d'etat ended the democratic period and started a military regime. But we were able to recover our democracy in 1988-89, together with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain. And it was done in a very wise way. Normally, transitions from a military government to a democratic government occurs in the middle of political crisis, economic chaos, and social violence. This was not the case of Chile, because we learned from our mistake and we were able to reach a very deep and broad agreement in order to pave the way to the recuperation of our democracy. And therefore, we need to strengthen the old traditional pillars, stable democracy and rule of law, a, a social responsible open market economy, and an effective sta state in the search of social justice. But we are fully aware that that is necessary but is not sufficient. In order to become a developed country, we need to avoid what has been called the middle income trap of developing countries. History has shown us that these three pillars are not enough anymore. In the 60s, there were many middle-income countries that wanted to become developed countries. And many fell into what has been called the middle-income trap. Let us recall the 80s and 90s when many economies, especially those from Latin America, suffered from stagnation and turbulence for almost 20 years. And only a handful managed to move from underdevelopment to development. Among them, you can name Japan, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, 
and that's it. That's why the transit or the evolution or the transition from underdevelopment to development has never been easy. And the best proof of that, that only a bunch of countries have been able to accomplish that goal. Mountaineers know very well that the second half of the ascent to the summit is definitely the most beautiful, but we are very much aware that it's also the most difficult and the toughest one. That's why in Chile we are trying to build or to strengthen the new pillars of development. And I just want to mention them. But the first one is that we need to dramatically change the quality of our human capital, and that means that we need to change and reform our educational system and our training system. That's why we are so enthusiastic about this agreement that we have with the Columbia University, because we are sure that you can be a very good partner in this challenge. The second thing is that we want to double or triple our investment in science and technology to become part of this society of knowledge and information. The third pillar is that we need to boost innovation and entrepreneurship, which is mainly or basically the most important renewable resource that we do have to attack this challenge and this effort towards development. We need to modernize our state, particularly in a world which is so dynamic and is changing so rapidly. We need a very flexible state in order to be able to adapt and take advantage of the opportunity. And finally, and this is a very important task, we are convinced that we need to defeat poverty and we need to reduce extreme inequalities and create a society with more equality of opportunities. Those are the five new pillars in which we are working very hard and with which we are 100% committed. How is this moving? Basically, this was set up in our government program, which had a special chapter for each of these new challenges. We committed ourselves to double our capacity to grow from 3%, which was the average of the former government, to 6%, which was our target. At the same time, we committed ourselves to create one million jobs in a four-year period. That's equivalent, if we compare it with the U.S., with a target of 20 million jobs in four years in order to get rid of unemployment and reach a situation of full employment. The third goal was to eradicate extreme poverty, to improve the quality of education, to improve the quality of the health system, to reduce crime and drug trafficking, and to modernize the state and strengthen our democracy. Those were the seven main commitments that we made during our campaign. And of course, during the campaign you commit yourself, when you are in government you have to fulfill and comply with your commitments. How are things going? First of all, why we needed to grow at 6%? For many reasons. First of all, because that was the necessary growth rate in order to become a developed country and achieve a per capita income of $24,000, which is above what today have countries like uh, Portugal, Greece, and many other Europeans. And we were aware that for that, we needed to increase substantially our capacity to grow. In the first three years, our average growth has been 5.8%, despite many difficulties. One of the difficulties was already mentioned. 11 days before we took office, the fifth worst earthquake and tsunami in the known history of mankind hit our country. And it was a devastating one. It destroyed one out of every three schools, one out of every three hospitals, thousands of roads, bridges, airports, ports, infrastructure. The total bill at the end of the day, after a few minutes, we had lost in a few minutes almost 20% of our GMP in terms of destroyed infrastructure. And that happened only a few days before we took office. But that was not the only difficulty. The other difficulty was that the world has been in a permanent crisis since then. It started in 2008, and you know that very well because maybe 
the zero zone was right here in New York, and it hasn't yet ended. And that was the second difficulty that we had to face and address. The third one was that the country that we received was losing its capacity to grow and create jobs and increase productivity and improve salaries and increase investment. And therefore, we had to change the tide, and that's something which you know very well is never easy. But those were the main difficulties. What has been the results? Basically, we can distinguish three periods in the last part of our economic history. The first is between 86 and 97, where we behave as a hair. The growth rate was above 7%. Productivity was increasing in a very substantial way. Creation of new jobs was, was very strong. And we were growing much faster than the rest of the world. Unfortunately, something happened in the late 90s. Because from 1998 to 2009, 2009 another 12-year period, we behaved as turtles. Because the growth rate went down by half, the same thing happened with productivity and job creation, and we were growing at a lesser path than the rest of the world, as can be seen in this graph. So our commitment was to recover that leadership, that dynamism, because it was absolutely necessary to achieve our goal to become a developed country without poverty before the end of the decade. And therefore, in the last three years, Chile has recovered its leadership. We went from what was called the Chilean miracle to the Chilean nap. This is something that was established by, the, by a very famous magazine called The Economist. And now we are recovering that dynamism and that leadership which is absolutely necessary to achieve our goals. But if we keep growing at 6% per year, which was, has been basically what we have done in the last three years, we will be able to become a developed country before the end of this decade by achieving a 24,000 per capita income level, which is the threshold that separates, according to the World Bank, the developed world from the developing world. That's why we are working in this direction. You can see that already we have jumped many places in terms of the ranking of per capita income, and we are not only in the first place in Latin America, but we are also uh, overpassing some European countries, and we need to keep growing at this, pace, at this pace to achieve our goal. But we have a lot of strength in order to achieve this goal. For instance, here we have some economic and human development indices, which are basically these are, uh, established by the World Bank, by the UN, by the Economic World Forum, and you can see that if you compare Chile in terms of Human Development Index, or Economic Freedom Index, or Ease to Doing Business Index, or Global Competitive Index, we are, to some extent, closer to the average of the OECD country than to the average of the Latin American countries. And that's a very strong base in order to start and address this huge challenge of changing what has been our history for the last 200 years. The same thing if we take other indices which measure quality of institutions, like rule of law, political stability, and others. You see that in these indices, which are international indices, again, Chile is prepared to undertake this new jump, big jump, in order to become a developed country. Now, with respect to the integration to the rest of the world, here you have a map in which are shown all the countries with which we have free trade agreements. You can see that we have free trade agreements with North America, with Latin America, with Europe, with China, with Japan, with Korea, with India, and therefore, we are very well prepared to take advantage of this new global world which is emerging under our eyes. And we are also working in new initiatives. One of them is the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, in which we are partners with the U.S. And if we are able to accomplish this goal, the target of the date was the end of this year in our next APEC meeting in Bali, 
it would become the largest free trade zone in the world. It started with four countries, Brunei, Singapore, New Zealand, and Chile. And now we are 12 members because the US, Canada, and Japan have joined in. And therefore, that's one of the most important initiatives in which we are working in order to enlarge this free trade zone of the Asia Pacific. The second is initiative is the Pacific Alliance, which is an alliance which is very new, very, very young. It was signed only one year ago in Chile in a place which is called Paranal, where we have the, one of the largest observatories to see and watch the skies and the stars. But in one year, it has been extremely fruitful. Right now, we do have a free trade agreement between the four countries, which uh, liber liberalized, is, uh, has liberalized tariffs for more than 90% of the goods and services that are being traded between these countries. But it's not only trade of services and goods. It's also an, an economic integration that takes into account physical integration, energy integration, and also free movement of people between all these countries. And we are joining forces in order to be able to take advantage of all the possibilities that this new Asia-Pacific world is offering and is putting in front of our eyes. But what have been the results? Here you can compare what was happened in 2009, which was the last year of the former government, and what has happened in the last three years. You can see that growth went from negative to positive, and we are uh, averaging almost 6% per year. Unemployment went down, and we are very close to a full employment situation. In terms of job creation, we have been able to create more than 830,000 jobs in three years and a half, which is, a very, is, is, is the highest job creation rate in the history of our country. The same thing with exports, we have gone up from $55 billion to almost $80 billion. And productivity and investment of growth, which have been double or almost tripling our rate of growth of GMP, and therefore investment as a percentage of GMP is going up. That means that we are moving in the right direction. If we keep at this speed and the same direction, we will be able to achieve the, the goal of becoming a developed country. Now, this, of course, has also to do not only with growth and economic variables, but also with the most important thing, which is improving the, the, improving the quality of life of our people. And here you have some indicators in terms of uh, different aspects. For instance, in 2009, only 4.8 million people used to take vacations, summer vacation. That figure has almost doubled in three and a half years, and it's a good indicator of how the quality of life of people, and you can measure it in terms of cinema ticket sold, or books edited, or travels abroad, or new cars sold, and so many other indicators. So we think that Chile is moving in the right direction. We are fully aware that still we will have to face many, many challenges. We know that the second part of this adventure is the most beautiful one, but it's also the most difficult one. But at the same time, we are fully aware that this is our mission. It's our responsibility to do what our fathers and grandfathers always wanted but never accomplished. And there is nothing. Nothing should divert us from that goal. That's why, as President of Chile, we can, of course, be, we are not, of course, satisfied with what we, are, we have already accomplished, because always we want to accomplish more. But in a few decades, Chile has been able to recover its democracy, which is the normal way of life of the Chilean people, and at the same time, recover its dynamism, leadership in terms of be able to improve substantially our capacity to grow, create jobs, improve salaries, reduce poverty, and if we keep moving in the same direction and at the same speed, Chile probably will become the first, hopefully not the only one, Latin American country able to get rid of poverty, overcome underdevelopment, and integrate itself to that very special club of countries which have been able to compatibilize democracy, 
with development and with peace. That is our target and that's why we are so committed and so enthusiastically committed with this task, which of course is something that we think that we owe, not only to our people today, but also to our sons and the, and the sons of our sons, because we are very grateful with God because we have received probably the most magnificent country in the world. Thank you very much. The floor is open now to uh, questions. There are microphones on each of the two aisles, so if you do have a question, I urge you to go to the microphone. And when you ask your question, please let us know who you are uh, and uh, try to keep your questions brief. Over here. Um, my name is Sarah Fakhri. Um, I studied abroad in Chile a while ago, but um, President Panera, as the first democratically elected center-right president after the transition, uh, what would you consider your greatest accomplishment as president? Thank you, Sarah. I would say three things. First of all, to be able to reconstruct our country in four years. Let me tell you a little story. I met with the Prime Minister of Japan, and I asked him how long it would take for them to reconstruct what had been destroyed by their earthquake and tsunami. And he told me at least 10 years and three years of recession. In our case, our target was four years to reconstruct and without recession. That's something which I think is a very important accomplishment, not only of the government, of course, of the Chilean people. The second is to recover our capacity to grow and to create jobs and to innovate, because that's something that is very easy to lose and is very hard to recover. And the third accomplishment is a more emotional one. And I remember those times with a great deal of nostalgia and emotion. It was the search and rescue of our 33 miners when they were lost in the depth of a mine in the driest desert in the world and nobody knew where they were, where they were alive or dead, but the Chilean government had the will and the commitment to look for them and honor the commitment that I made personally with the families. I remember when I arrived there and nobody knew what was happening. I told them that we would In 1997 and your election, which you was present during, um, saw slower economic growth. So my question is, how do you intend to build institutions and what programs have you put in place that will help guarantee that that 6% growth that you have set out for Chile will continue th throughout the decade even after you are no longer president and governments with somewhat different views from yours might take power? Thank you, Carl. Well, nobody can guarantee that. So, we are having elections by the end of this year, and the new government will take power in March 2014. And nobody can guarantee that a country like Chile will keep growing at 6% a year. So it will be basically the responsibility of the new government to keep this trend. And I hope that they will realize that the most important factor in growth is freedom. Freedom to innovate. Freedom to start new projects. Freedom to unleash all the forces that are behind freedom and when you try to control those forces, the only thing that you will get is stagnation. So I cannot guarantee you that. Nobody can guarantee you that. That's something that will have to be achieved by the new government, but I hope that they will realize two things. First of all, that the best way to undertake this challenge is by reinforcing and strengthening our democratic system, the rule of law, respect for human rights. And the second lesson is that the best way to achieve that target is by unleashing the tremendous forces of freedom that lives in the heart of every citizen in the world, and particularly lives in the hearts of every Chilean because we have proved that when we 
work in a democratic system and with unity, Chile has proved that we are able to achieve goals that may seem impossible for many people, and we have proved that impossible is nothing. Yes, over here. My name is Vasilis Fenakis. I'm a professor of Earth and Environmental Engineering at uh, Columbia, director of the Center for Life Cycle Analysis. I echo and I applaud the message for freedom. I actually grew up in a country that was under a military dictatorship at the same time with the military dictatorship of Pinochet. So I'm cognizant of the difficulties and uh, I applaud the pathway, the roadmap towards development. I have been looking carefully at the indicators that you have uh, in the terms of measuring the development, and I see, in my opinion, something that is missing, allow me, is energy. Actually, in the list of the scientists like me, we have energy at the very top, and uh, that is not only for the development of the country, but also as a citizen of the world, uh, that uh, it uh, is connected both with poverty and climate change and so many other issues. And I know that uh, actually mining needs a lot of energy and mining is concentrated in the northern part of the country and you have the best solar resources perhaps of the world up there. And uh, the Atacama Desert is very dry, so you don't have a lot of water to use it by burning coal and LNG. And I see a perfect synergy there between solar energy and the need for increased electricity for mining. And I know that uh, you, your administration brought a, a law to the Congress, a renewable energy law that the Congress approved. And I think it's very important for that law to become a reality. And I know that you have political forces from the current status quo that they oppose any change. So my question is, uh, are you behind this law? Obviously you are, because you brought it up. But what do you think of how you can overcome the political forces that are opposing this change? getting from burning more coal and more LNG and more diesel into solar and wind. Thank you, Nassim. It's right. You're right. We didn't mention energy. It doesn't mean that it's not important. Actually, it's a key factor in our road or path to development. Chile was a very poor country in oil fuels, fossil fuels. We didn't have much oil or gas. But Chile is extremely rich in the new sources of energy renewable, clean energy like wind energy, solar energy, geothermal energy. And we are trying to change the institution and the laws in order to enable us to take advantage of those new sources of energy. And solar is a key one. Actually, we are investing in, in, in new renewable energy more than 10 times what was the average of the past because we are fully aware that it's a question of time when those new sources of energy will become economically competitive. But in Chile, we have a special, a special challenge in this area because, as you said, it's true, we have a tremendous potential in, for these new sources of energy. We have the deserts with the highest radiance, solar radiance in the world. And we were having lunch today with people in, related to the energy sector, and they are extremely enthusiastic and optimistic about what we can do in Chile with this new source of energy. That's why we're exploring solar energy, wind energy, geothermal energy, wave energy, and we are putting a lot of public money in order to promote, because we know that that will come, and we try to, we're trying to accelerate that time in order to have those new sources of energy right now when we need it. For instance, in the northern part of the country is a desert. Chile, by the way, Chile, some people think that Chile is very sick because the head is very warm and the feet are very cold. In the northern part of the country, we have the desert. In the southern part of the country, we have the South Pole. But things are going are, are looking very promising in this respect because the way that the technology in terms of solar and wind energy is improving, at the fast that it is improving, it means that very soon it will be economically fully competitive. And when that happens, wind and solar energy will be much more important than oil or gas or, or coal energy in Chile. And that will be extremely needed for many reasons. First of all, because in the northern part of the country we have more than 100 billion in terms of investment projects that will need energy and water. And if you have cheap energy, you will be able to digitalize, how do you say that, 
this lines or this line water how do you say this lines water and therefore we will be able not only to produce energy but also to desalinize water and pump it all the way up to the mountains where the mines are. That's why energy and water are two key factors that normally we thought that they were very abundant and now we realize that we have to take good care of them because those two may become the most important restriction for the world capacity to grow. That we started working with the University of Antofagasta and probably the University of Santiago on this challenge trying to help there. Good, you are welcome. Thank you. <laughs> when did you start it? Uh, just now, actually. Uh, perhaps a couple of weeks ago, we, pre uh, we had a paper ready to present to the European Photovoltaic Conference in, uh, in Paris uh, late this month. Okay. And, uh, and in January, actually, it will be in the University of Antofagasta on uh, the first symposium on lithium Great. and so on. You are most welcome. Come back with us in our plane tomorrow. <laughs> yes. So, Excelencia Sebastián Piñera, uh, my name is Christopher Grant, and my question for you would be, how would you answer some critics who claim that your education program, your education investment is outdated before it even began? Let me tell you what we're doing, and then we might conclude whether it is outdated or not. First of all, we, when we we're running our campaign. One of the key and most important factors that we were strengthening was that we needed to improve the quality of the education substantially. For instance, we, now we have been able to guarantee access to preschool education, universally and free for everybody. That's a major change because that's where you can make the biggest, def the biggest differences. Because at that time is when you can change and you can produce real equality of opportunities. So normally, all the attention was concentrating on higher education or university, university education, and we had overlooked what was happening with preschool education, two, three, four years, when those kids, particularly if they belong to poor or vulnerable families, they They need to have this input in terms of the right education and motivation, and that's something that we have already accomplished. Now we can guarantee our investment in education from $9 billion to $14 billion in three years. That's the highest jump in our investment in education in our history. But also we are taking into account what is happening with the higher university, because, uh, university education, because that's where we have had the most significant problems. What we have committed. First of all, that no student will be left out of university education because of lack of resources. And for that, we guarantee scholarships for every student belonging to the 60% of the poorest household in Chile and subsidized loan for the rest. And therefore, today, nobody in Chile can say that he will be left or she will be left out of higher education because of lack of resources, because the government is guaranteeing that. But of course, even though we're investing much more money in terms, in a strategy that we have called three by three, because we are trying to attack the three problems, access, financing, and quality at the three level, preschool, school, and higher education. But of course, we're just starting. And therefore, it's true that what we have done or what we have accomplished up to now is not enough. Even though the quality of the Chilean education, we had been stagnated for 20 years, and I'm talking about these international measurements like the PISA or TIMS exams, is finally improving and very, in a very substantial way. That's why when people think that we can accomplish all the results in terms of improving the quality of education in a three-year period, they are dreaming. They don't know what they're talking about. So if somebody thinks that all the results should be ready in three years, and because of that, because we, not, we haven't been able to reach that, he thinks that the system or what we're doing is not the right policy. I think that he ha doesn't have the right evidence to conclude that. We think that what we're doing is the right thing because we're guaranteeing access, financing, and quality education for every student 
from preschool, school, and higher education. Yes, over here. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Johnny Cohen. I'm a first year student, uh, engineering student. And with the building of the very large telescope in Chile, Chile has had a global presence in the scientific community. What is Chile doing to maintain this? Chile is very committed with the world community. We were part, founders of the United Nations, the World Bank, the IMF, and we are probably playing a role which is not equivalent to our size or our e economic GNP. And we think that we can and we should keep playing that role in the international community. That's why, for instance, Chile is not Chile now is not receiving any foreign aid. We have moved from receiving to providing foreign aid to other countries because we feel that that is our responsibility. But I agree with you that for us, the presence and the commitment of Chile with the international community and the new problems that we will have to face together, because in the past, problems were at the national scale. Today, that's not, even, that's not more the case. In order to defeat, for instance, climate change, terrorism, or drug trafficking, we need to work together. That's why Chile believes in international organization, even though they have problems. And Chile believes in international cooperation because we are fully convinced that that's the only way to move forward in an efficient way, given the kind of problems and the nature of the problems that we are facing today. Do you want to follow up with, uh, did you mention is astronomy? I, I was asking about the very large telescope in Chile. Oh, yeah. Um, and how, I guess, Chile is going to stay ahead well, in science. You know that in Chile, we have the clearest and brightest skies in the world. That's why we have already become the world capital of astronomy. We have many, many international ventures which are uh, investing in astronomy in our country. We a few times, a few months ago, we inaugurated the biggest telescope in the world, which is called ALMA. And we are providing all the necessary guarantees and facilities in order to keep moving in that direction and transform Chile, which already is the capital of, of astronomy in the world, in, real, in a real center for research and development. And we are planning to open another telescope, which is, will be called the Extreme Large Telescope, that will be able to go back in the history of the universe. Right now, we have been able to go back 12,300 years back in the history of the universe. People think that the history of the universe goes all the way back to 12,700 years. With this new Extreme Large Telescope, we will be approaching or we will be getting closer to what was called the Big Bang, which is considered the origin of the universe. And therefore, we are very enthusiastic about that. We are providing not only our skies and our facilities, but also we are investing a lot of public and private money in developing that area of our society. Thank you. Yes, here. Buenas tardes, Excelencia. Um, my name is Jose Francisco Charger. I'm a first year student here at Columbia College. I was just in Chile a month ago. It's beautiful, by the way. I've been there before. I'll probably go there again. I loved it. Um, but when I was there, I noticed there were a lot of protests that were going on regarding issues like education and healthcare, where the people aren't demanding that the government isn't doing enough, or maybe the government, they, haven't, they don't know what the government's doing. One, what would be your answer to those people? Who, um, who are demanding these things and what kind of, what are you putting in place for that? And my second question is, you all, you, um, Chile is always comparing itself with the rest of Latin America and with the OECD countries. And we can see that there's obviously like a gap growing between Chile and the rest of Latin America. What has your government, or if, if your government hasn't done much, what do you propose that the Chilean government do, um, should do to kind of help the rest of Latin America get to that point? Well, the government never do enough or never does enough. Hmm? Do or does? Does. does. <laughs> well, the government never does enough. That's something which is true, has always been true, and will always be true, and that applies also to your government. But 
I would say that the important thing is that the Chilean society has changed and is more, much more impatient, is much more aware of the rights, is looking, I mean, is looking at the skies with the, uh, in terms of asking for the best. And I think that's good because that puts, puts a lot of pressure on governments to do better and to move fast. But of course, if you don't realize that you have half your eyes in the skies because that's the future, the hope, you also have to have your feet in the ground because that's realism. But tell me any one country where people do not protest. Either it is a dictatorship or they are not alive. Chile, we have a democracy and we are very much alive. <laughs> yes, over here. Mr. President, I'm Melissa Martinez. I'm from Mexico, first year student at the School of International and Public Affairs. What are the concrete expected benefits that will be derived from the free transit of people clause in the Pacific Alliance for its members and in general for Latin America? Well, the Pacific Alliance is a deep effort of integration between these four countries, Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Chile. And one of the main issues, and one of the most difficult issues, was to allow free movement of people. Because when you allow free movement of goods and services, it's good. When you allow free movement of capitals and you integrate your financial markets, it's better. When you integrate physically your countries with, LA, with the energy and roads, it's even better. But I think that the key question, or the key test of a real integration is when you allow free movement of people. And we have just reached an agreement with Mexico because with Mexico we had free movement of people from a long time ago, but Mexico ha had to agree to give the same benefits to Peruvians and Colombians. And, and finally they did. And I hope that this will prove that we are integrated not only in terms of goods and services, but the most important part is integration in terms of people. So we are already seeing a lot of students from Colombia or Peru or Mexico or Chile going to other countries to, to fulfill their studies. And a lot of uh, entrepreneurs moving from one country to another. A lot of joint ventures. All those things will Im allow us to join forces to be able to face the huge challenge that we will have to face in order to be part of this new Pacific, Asia-Pacific Alliance. So it's, it's so new. Only one year is the, the age of the Pacific Alliance that we have yet to measure what will be the benefit. But I tend to anticipate or predict that a real integration has to include free movement of people. Thank you. Yes. Señor Presidente, my name is Mauricio Larraín from Chile. I'm a professor of finance at the business school. Um, so I have also a question about education. So in the last two weeks, uh, two important countries, uh, Mexico and Brazil, have implemented important changes to their educational system, Mexico, by um, allowing teachers to be evaluated and uh, reducing the power of the teacher, teachers' unions, and uh, Brazil by allocating 75% of oil revenues uh, towards education. Uh, regarding Chile, what do you think is the main reform that's missing uh, in order to improve the quality of our educational system? Many. There are many reforms that are in the process of being implemented. But basically, let me tell you what has been our main differences with some of the leaders of the university student movement. They ask me for two things with which I fully disagree. First of all, some of them want to get rid of private education. And they want the government or the state to monopolize 100% of education at every level. We disagree with that because we think that that will not only jeopardize the quality of education, but will kill freedom. And without freedom, education is nothing. That's we we disagree as well. <laughs> we disagree as well. And therefore, what we, are, what we are defending is that we should have a mixed system where we have public and private school, private and public university, and students or their parents, depending on the age of the students, have the right to decide. We have not the right to take that power decision from the students or from their parents. And that's a big difference. Because if you get 
get rid of private education, at the end of the day, the government will monopolize education. And from there to the step where they will try to utilize that monopoly in terms of trying to influence people, I think that's a huge risk, not only for quality, but also for freedom. And therefore, we are defending a mixed system where you will have private and private school, private and public university, and we are defending the right of students or parents to decide, to decide whether, where they want to study and what they want to study. We don't think that the government has the right to take away that decision power from the people. That's one big difference. It's an ideological difference. That's why we say that the government has the, has the duty to guarantee that everybody will have access to preschool, school, and higher education. But we don't have the right to take away that decision from the students or the parents. And that's why we are defending that we will give scholarships or loans to everybody, but we will not interfere with the decision with respect to where and what to study. That's one big difference that has been there for the last three years. The second big difference is that we don't agree that education should be free for everybody at every level with no, uh, with no conditions. Because Chile is still a country that has a lot of social problems. And therefore we say that the government will guarantee free education at preschool and school level. But at the higher level, which is the university level, we will guarantee access and funding. Scholarship for 60% of the students, loans for the next 30%, and the richest 10% will have to pay from their own pockets from their education. And many of the students are asking for free education for everybody at every level with no conditions. And we disagree with that too, because we think that we have so many other social problems that the government shouldn't be channeling uh, resources which are paid by the taxes of everybody to fund the education of the richest groups of our country. Those are the biggest two differences that we have with some of the student leaders, leaders and have been in the public eye for the last uh, two or three years. And we have not and will not give up on any of those two positions. Finally, what we are doing, of course, is trying to improve the quality of education. And for that, we need to improve the quality of teachers. And teachers worldwide don't like to be measured. And we have said very simple, if you don't like to be measured, okay, you will stay in the old system. But if you want to become part of the new system, where they, they will get much better salaries and much better opportunity, you need to be evaluated. And if you don't pass that exam, you won't be able to access the new system. So we will have an old system and a new system, and therefore teachers will have to make a decision. If they want to become part of the new system with much better salaries and opportunities and many other things, they will need to pass an exam. And if they pass it, they will be eligible for the new system. If they don't, they won't. And of course they don't like it. So that's another difference, which was the same discussion in Mexico. I just talked on the phone to President Peña Nieto, and he was telling me how that uh, fight is going over in Mexico. And with respect to resources, I, 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 I'm aware that Brazil has decided to allocate a, a given percentage, almost 70% of oil, to education. In our case, we are investing almost 25% of public expenditure in education. One out of every four dollars in our budget goes to education. And that's one of the highest percentages in Latin America and one of the highest percentages in the world. That's why we have increased our public expenditure in education from 9 billion to 14 billion. That's almost a 60% increase in three years because we're fully convinced that in order to be able to solve the three problems in the three levels, quality, access, and financing, at preschool, school, and university education, we needed to increase the public expenditure on education as much as necessary. And uh, by the end of this week, I will present the budget for 2014. And again, education and health will be the two sectors with the highest increase in terms of uh, our budget. Yes. Uh, Mr. President, my name is Gustavo Guimarães. I am a first-year student at 
uh, in the CBS MBA program, and I'm come from Brazil, a fellow South, South American. And like in the last decade or so, we've seen that uh, many South American countries, Brazil, Argentina, they have turned into like left-wing populist countries. And while Chile and Colombia, they have kept on the sensible economic track with you know, free trade policies and everything. And what do, you, what do you give credit for Chile keeping on the right track, not falling to the populism? Well, populism is a very contagious illness. <laughs> I agree. And if you take a look at Latin America, you will be, you can prove that statement. I don't want to really to judge what other countries are doing. Because we live in a world where we have to learn to live with our differences. But of course, what we are doing in Chile, for instance, in terms of our democratic model, our development model, is very different from what other Latin American countries are doing. And I think that, and that's why we are doing it, we think that at least for Chile, our model is the best one for us. And we are fully aware that populism and violence are very strong enemies of democracy, of real democracy, and are very <coughs> strong enemies of real economic development. We cannot guarantee, because we will have elections, and you know that when we have elections, candidates become very populist and they promise everything, this world and the other. But one of them will be elected. So my only message to the candidate is remember that one of them will have to honor the commitments. And therefore, they have to learn that they cannot promise what they cannot fulfill. And therefore, they will have to be or they should be much more responsible. And that's something which is very difficult to put in the ears or in the minds of candidates. Because what they say back is, look, first I have to win and then I will be responsible. But many times you are caught with your own promises and commitments while you were a candidate. That's why we, we hope that the, the election that will take place in Chile by the end of this year will not change the path or the speed of our uh, transition towards development. I've been informed that the President has other obligations. Uh, and I'm sorry to cut off conversation so quickly, so perhaps the first two people on each side could ask their questions all at once, one after the other, uh, and the President will respond. And I'm afraid the rest of you that we won't have time, starting here. You can send me your question by email. No problem. I'll do it tonight. Yeah. No, no. Uh, you, can do, you can make it right here. Sure. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mr. President, for your Unless talk. you want to give your place to somebody else. <laughs> no, it's okay. No, yeah, it's I can. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm a sophomore at Columbia College, and uh, I'm a student from China. Um, as you know, uh, China and Chile enjoy a very strong historical relationship, and Chile was actually the first South American country to recognize mainland China. So my question is, um, what is the current cooperation between China and Chile in terms of political and economic cooperation, and what other steps taken that can be taken to uh, further these cooperations? Yes, over here. Thanks so much for your time. My name is Camila Fierro. Both my parents are Chilean, but I was born in Ohio. My question has more to do with human rights and why Chile still recognizes some generals that have been tried and found guilty of human rights violations, such as Manuel Contreras. Next question from this side. Uh, buenas tardes, señor presidente. Uh, my name is Benji or Benjamin de la Piedra. Uh, I'm a senior in the college here. Uh, I'm an American citizen, but my mother is Chilean. Uh, she came here to pursue her master's degree. I met my father uh, in college here. Um, all this to say that uh, I've been back to Chile a number of times uh, thanks to the United Nations home leave policy. Um, so I love the country. My mother is, has always planned to go back when she's retired. Uh, but recently, uh, a friend of mine who's also an American citizen with a Chilean mother went back to Chile. Uh, and had basically they, they went to San Pedro Atacama, they rented a car, they parked the car to go see some sites, and then when they came back, the car had been stripped clean, everything in it was robbed. Uh, they went to the police station, the police were rather dismissive, they sort of took it as ordinary business perhaps. Um, all this to say that when I told the story to my mom, she said, you know, I've been watching the news a lot, there's a lot of delinquencia these days, and I'm seriously reconsidering um, 
my you know plans to move back. I might just stay in America, even though that wasn't part of what I was planning. Uh, so I was wondering, A, how you might respond, and B, if you could just generally comment on uh, what, what you're doing to combat crime. Last question. Muchas gracias, su excelente. My name is Baba Tunde Wooder James. I'm a second year student in the engineering school. And my question relates to the middle income trap that you were talking about earlier in your presentation. One of the parts that you were saying to uh, get past the middle income trap is to alleviate poverty. So my question to you is, what specific policies has your administrative has your administration enacted to reduce poverty in China? Thank you very much. So we have four questions. Yes. China, human rights, crime, and poverty. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true that we have had for the last 42 years a very strong and special relationship with China. Chile was the first country to recognize China more than 40 years ago, the first country to recognize its condition as market economy, the first country to support its uh, application to the uh, World Trade Organization and many other things. And I have had the chance to visit China as a citizen, as, as president. And by now, China has become by far the largest trading partner of Chile, much larger than the U.S. or Europe, and growing and uh, not only in terms of uh, goods and services, because now we are entering into the phase of investments. What has to be done in the future? First of all, we need to, to incorporate investment and try to reach a, a, a treaty to protect investment in both, both in China and Chile and to uh, reach another, of, another uh, agreement in order to avoid double taxation. That's something that is being worked right now with China. But uh, many people were very afraid with this uh, integration with China, but it has, been, it has proved that in order to, to compete with China, you need to be very flexible and very active. And we have a very healthy trade with China right now. And as I told you, it has become the largest trading partner of Chile and many other Latin American countries and by far. And uh, we are working on the TPP. China is not part of the TPP, but eventually one day it will become part of it. And at that time, that TPP will be by far the largest free trade zone in the world. With respect to what Camila was asking about human rights, it's very simple. We had a very dark period in terms of human rights in Chile. From 1973 to 1989, which was the time of the military regime, huge, permanent, and unacceptable human rights violation took place in Chile. But after we recover our democracy, one of the main lessons that we have learned, that under no circumstance, in no place, and in no time, human rights violation could be accepted, because they always have to be rejected. And people that were involved in those human rights violations, for instance, you mentioned General, General Contreras, he has been judged and uh, condemned by the Chilean justice. Actually, I think that his condemn uh, is for more than 300 years in prison. So we think that in order to be able to reconcile the country, we need to move forward and do our best efforts in terms of uh, finding more truth and providing more justice, because that's the only way to a real solid reconciliation within the Chilean society. With respect to the question made by Benjamin, well, first of all, tell your mother that she is most welcome in Chile. So maybe she had a bad experience. I can tell you something, something similar to me happened when I was in San Francisco a year ago. <laughs> it doesn't mean that because of that, I don't want to be here once and, and again and again. So maybe she had a bad experience. We are very concerned and very aware that the crime and delinquency problem in Chile and in, in many other countries is a very serious one, and we are fighting it with all our will, commitment, and resources. For instance, we're increasing substantially the size of our police force. We are changing the laws in order to be tougher on, on people that commit uh, these kind of crimes. But remember that the first homicide was committed by Cain. Huh? And at that time, there were only four people in the, in the, in the earth. Adam, Eve, 
Cain and Abel. And one of them committed an homicide and he killed his brother, Adam. And therefore, crime has been with us since the beginning of our times. We have been able to reduce crime substantially in Chile. For instance, the victimization rate, which is the percentage of households that have been victims of crime, have went down by more than 25% in the last three years. So if your mother is really very afraid of this, tell her that three years from now it will go down by 50%, and at that time I hope that she will be able to come back to her country without having to face those problems and troubles. At that time, maybe you can go with her and protect her, <laughs> because you sent her alone, <laughs> and that's a shame on you. <laughs> Finally, with respect to poverty, we are, you know that there are many measures of poverty. One is called extreme poverty, and the other one is called poverty. According to the World Bank, if you live with less than $1 per day, you are in extreme poverty. If you live with less than $2 a day, you are living in poverty. In Chile, our standards are much higher, much higher. Actually, almost twice as much. But we had made a commitment to be able to defeat extreme poverty within our government. I'm seeing here our Minister of, of Social Development, and you have to be fully aware of that commitment, because by March 2014, you will have to answer about that. <laughs> and we hope that we will be able to eliminate extreme poverty in Chile. In terms of poverty, I just was reading a report that 40 million Americans are living below the line of poverty in this country, which is one of the richest countries in the world. So it's not easy, really, to accomplish this task. But we have been able to reduce poverty, and we have implemented a very revolutionary program, which is called Ethical Family Income, which is not a typical assistance program but it's a kind of strategic alliance between the government and the poor families by which they receive some support and some income transfers on the part of the government, unconditionally just because they are poor, but the rest is based on whether they accomplish their duties. For instance, if they send their kids to school with more than 95% of assistance or if they keep their health exams uh, uh, on time, and they receive even more if they are able to reach some goals, for instance, improving the performance, the educational performance of the kids, or if they join the labor force. And this program, which is called the Ethical Family Income, is, has been designed to be able to de defeat extreme poverty in, during our four-year periods and to defeat poverty before the end of this decade. And therefore, for us, the country with which we are dreaming and with which we are committed is a country that is not only developed in terms of per capita income, but is developing in a much, a much more integral way. And one of the key aspects is a country without poverty, with more equality of opportunity, and that will guarantee everybody dignity in its life just because they, have, they live in Chile and also opportunities to fulfill their dreams and to take advantage of their talents. That's why for us to respect of human rights under any circumstance, any time, anywhere, is a key aspect of our project, and to get rid of poverty is another key aspect of our project. And if we keep moving at the same speed and in the same direction, we will be able to accomplish all those goals within the next four or five years. That means before the end of this decade. Thank you very much. Mr. President, on behalf of Columbia University, I want to thank you first for your efforts that have, uh, in the last minutes, resulted, uh, you are better informed than I, in the signing of an agreement between Colombia and the government of Chile uh, to make sure that the movement of faculty and students back and forth uh, between our two countries uh, it accelerates. I also want to thank you for your cogent, thoughtful, and inspiring remarks this afternoon. I hope you will come back to Colombia many times in the future. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>